All right, kiddos, this is your earmuffs warning. This is not an over-the-top raunchy podcast, but if you've read my books, you know I'm not afraid to use some colorful language. We might also cover some adult topics if they come up in the questions, so just be aware of that. Finally, I need to remind you that while I am a therapist, I'm not your therapist, so please don't try to use this as a substitute for professional help. Also, uh, please don't try to sue me. Thank you. All right, what is up, ladies, gentlemen, and friends of all varieties? This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, Episode 11. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, a psychologist from Southern California and the author of the Hardcore Self-Help book series. And uh, this is another question and answer episode. So if you're new to the show, I do um, alternating episodes. So one week I do question and answer where you can ask me questions about mental health, therapy, psychology, life, relationships, sex, school, anything you want. And then on the other weeks, I do interviews with people that I find interesting and people that I think you would like to hear from. So next week is another interview and I have uh, Angel Jeffria. Hopefully I'm saying that name right. We went back and forth so many times about how to say her name. Jeffria. Um, she is a congenital amputee, which means she's had um, an amputation since birth or was born without part of her her arm. So her left arm is uh, is missing a hand and a portion of the forearm, I think. And uh, she uses a bionic limb. So it's a um, hand that goes on and it is articulating. So she can move her fingers, she can grab things, she can rotate it around. And um, we talk about all kinds of stuff, what it's like to live, you know, with a with a bionic arm that looks robotic versus something that's cosmetic and trying to hide it and the community of people that she's met and all kinds of stuff like that. So a really cool episode that'll be coming out next week. Um, but yeah, this week is a question and answer episode. If my voice is a little more subdued this week, that's because it's fatigued. <laughs> I've had a long day of, of work and I've been talking all day um, after I do assessments. So I do neuropsychological assessment, which means um, testing you for issues with your memory or attention, concentration, uh, multitasking, things like that. And um, after I do the testing, I do feedback sessions. So an hour of going through the results and explaining everything. So I had a, a few of those today. And so that's basically just me talking for an hour straight for each one. So my voice is a little fatigued. So please pardon that. Um, I did want to give a little shout out to our reviewer this week. So we got one review on iTunes and it's from uh, surf girl 21. So surf girl 21. Thank you very much. Um, you basically just said that uh, it's a really genuine down to earth self-help podcast, which I, I truly appreciate. Um, your guys feedback means a whole lot to me and reviews definitely do help. So please consider leaving a review on iTunes if you have not yet already. In my last question and answer episode, you guys responded pretty well to um, my little psychology tidbit at the beginning, so I thought I would share another one of those with you. Um, so this week I wanted to talk about a delusion. So there's this delusion that's called Copgras delusion. So it's a C A P G R A S, Copgras delusion, and it's a really interesting one. It's one that's not very common, but for one reason or, or another, I've seen a lot of people with it this year. Um, just in the past couple months, I've seen two people with it. And what it is, is the delusion, which in, in delusion, I'll back up a bit. A delusion is basically an unusual thought that you believe to be true, but other people do not, right? So for instance, a delusion of persecution, that's the feeling that everybody's out to get you. Delusions of grandeur, you might think that you're, you know, a messiah or something like that. The cop cross delusion is one that is uh, a bit different. So it's the feeling let me try to articulate it here. So it's the feeling that your house or your spouse or a loved one, something that's very intimate and obviously important to you, it's the feeling that it's been replaced with an imposter, the feeling that it's not the actual thing. So for an example, um, I met somebody who thought their house was not their house. So it was in the same place. It was in the same layout and everything like that. And they could admit those things. They could say factually, yes, it looks the same. It's in the same place. Everything about it's the same, but this is not the same house. It does not feel like the same house. This is an imposter house. 
and um, another person um, had more difficulty with their their wife, and they thought that they were they were kind of multiple imposter versions of their wife, and this led to a really interesting um, dilemma, which was uh, they were having trouble morally thinking that they were having sex with other people or going out on dates with other people. But in reality, it was just the same wife. And they were like, you know, I'll use Mary as a, as a generic name. They're like, what am I going to tell Mary? And Mary's like, well, I am Mary. So it's a very confusing and it can be very scary uh, delusion. And it's easy to think that it's memory. So sometimes people think that, oh, this person's older. Maybe they have Alzheimer's and they're just forgetting who I am. It's not the case. They know who you are. They just, it doesn't feel right to them. And it's something that's not completely well understood yet. But um, in general, a good way to think about it and the way that we think about it right now is that when you store memories, you store them with context cues. And one of those big context cues is uh, the emotion of the situation. Um, So if I ask you to think about home or think about summer vacation or think about uh, Christmas time or whatever means something to you, there is an emotion attached to that. When I ask you to think of your mother, your father, whether it's a positive or negative emotion, there's an emotion attached to it. You can almost palpably feel it when you picture them or when you think about them. Now, that's because the memory part of your brain is wrapped basically around the emotional part of your brain. It's, it's part of the same system, very close together in the brain. And what we think is happening with Capgras is that those things are disconnected. So you have the logical memory of what of what you're thinking of, but the emotion is not attached to it. So it just feels off. So you can recognize that factually this is true, this is true, this is true, but it doesn't feel like my wife. It doesn't feel like my home. It doesn't feel like my daughter or son. So it's a really, really, really trippy uh, delusion, and it's something that I've encountered a few times recently. So uh, I, you may never encounter it for your entire life, but if you do, then now you know. Cap grows delusion. Okay, so let's get into the questions now. If you have a question, you can ask at Duff the Psych on Twitter, or you can email me, um, Duff the Psych at gmail.com. Both of those are great ways to get in touch with me. Um, I guess you could also Facebook message on facebook.com slash Duff the Psych. Any way that you want to get a question to me is totally cool. Um, I did mention the subreddit last time on the Q&A episode. We have a subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash hardcore self-help. You can also ask questions there if you'd like. This first question comes from Kai through email, and it reads as follows. Um, Here's some context for you. I have a hard time accepting praise and often think that they are wrong. Once they're going to find out that I'm not good, they'll think I've fooled them and they won't like or support me anymore. Maybe it's because I'm a perfectionist, but I always think that I could have done better if I just put in more effort. I feel like what I'm saying or writing down during an exam is not good at all, and I still get top grades. It's strange because I know there's so much I don't know or don't have an answer to. To be honest, I study a lot because otherwise I would not feel comfortable enough to take the exams. While I believe it is important to stay modest, I still wish I could feel good about what I'm doing and somehow internalize my success. People are getting a bit frustrated by my mantra, I'm not good enough, it was nothing. Anyone could do that. Is there a workaround you know about? And I skipped the first part of the question, which is asking me to talk about what's called the imposter syndrome, or problems internalizing your success. So um, this is a a really good question that I wanted to take because it's so common. Um, I don't know if you recognize this or not. I'm talking to you, Kai. Um, but the imposter syndrome, it has a name for a reason. It's massively common, especially among successful people. Um, it's something that's a big topic in graduate school, for instance. Um, we talked about it so often in my PhD program and, you know, I'm not, uh, free myself. I, you know, I have a PhD in psychology and I still don't think of myself as smart sometimes, you know, I'm not like, oh, that's a smart guy. Um, I don't think of myself that way, but on paper, I should be, right? I'm an expert in this topic, but it just doesn't hit home sometimes. So what I'm trying to say is that the imposter syndrome is massively common. There's a lot of people that can probably empathize with you. And just to clarify, the imposter syndrome is basically feeling like uh, your successes are... So here, here's what it is. Basically, at a, at a fundamental level, you attribute your successes to luck. So you you attribute them to external factors that are just by chance. 
Um, and then when you uh, have something that goes more negatively, when you have a failure or something that just doesn't work out, that you attribute to internal characteristics. And obviously you can see where that might get you into trouble. When everything that goes wrong, you blame yourself. Everything that goes right, you blame the circumstance. If you flip that on its head, that would be a lot better. But with the imposter syndrome, that's kind of a cognitive error that you make where you misattribute these things. Um, misattribute, I guess. <laughs> My emphasis is a little off today. Um, it's really, really important um, to to work on this um, just for your own sake. You know, you can get by without doing anything about it, but having ownership of, of what you do, having ownership of your own successes, just it's good. It feels good. And I think that training yourself to recognize your accomplishments can help. So I've talked on my blog before. I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast, but my blog, I've talked about journaling and I have a particular method of journaling. Um, you can just go deftthepsych.com slash journal. And I, I explain it there. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of it, but one portion of what I do when I journal, and there are times when I journal every single morning is I pick three things from the previous week, the previous day, basically since the last time that I journaled, three things that I'm proud of. And when you first start doing this, it's probably going to be really hard to pick out three things that you're proud of because you're kind of trained to not do that. You're trained to pick out the negative things, not the things that you're actually proud of yourself for. And those things usually just slide off your back, but you need to force yourself to. And you can always find three things, even if they're small. And um, this is sort of training you to adjust your filter. Right now you have the filter on of just noticing the negative things and then really, really filtering out the positive things. It's like, you know, um, they have cameras that have filters and you could filter out a certain wavelength of light. The positive things that you've done are that wavelength of light and you're just completely filtering those out. And it's kind of almost like that, that delusion I was just talking about. It's definitely not a delusion, but you know, where you can recognize that those things that people are saying about you are true, but it just doesn't feel like you did it. It doesn't feel like it means anything. So this is this form of journaling, forcing yourself every day to write down at least three things that you are proud of uh, yourself for doing, things that you see as accomplishments that you're trying to take ownership of that can force you to really kind of adjust that mental filter. Another thing that can help is to think of somebody else. So think of a friend, somebody that you know, or somebody that you know of, and maybe they are similar to you in a lot of ways. So try to think of somebody that is uh, similar to you and use them sort of as an avatar. So what would you say to them if they came to you with the same issue? What would you say to them if they came to you and said, I, I did this, but it doesn't really feel like I deserve to be here. It doesn't feel like I deserve this praise or... I feel like I'm going to be found out. And once I'm found out, no one's, you know, everyone's going to know that I'm a fraud. Think about what you would say to them and put yourself into their shoes and try to have that conversation because they're going to say, well, I know what you're saying. It's nice and good, but you're just my friend. You can't actually, you know, it's not actually the truth. And then have that rebuttal with yourself. Say, no, this is why X, Y, Z, this is why it's true. So pick somebody to somebody that's ob objectively similar to you. Obviously, you might think this person is more successful than you are for, you know, no good reason, but objectively, they should be kind of similar. And so just imagine that they came to you with this issue. Talk them through it. Sometimes that can help you. And if you're kind of the more logical, scientific person, that's a really good thing. You can challenge yourself to be realistic and to be scientific about it. So this is really an example of emotional reasoning, which means I feel this way, therefore uh, this, is how it, this is how it is, right? I feel sad, therefore I'm not doing well, when that doesn't necessarily equate in real life. So this is emotional reasoning, and sometimes the antidote to that is being very clinical, very scientific, very, very straightforward about it. When you know that you can't trust your gut instinct about things emotionally, try to add up the pieces and see if you come to the same conclusion. Um, there's some basic hacks you can use, like forcing yourself to replace some of the language that you use. I have a suspicion that you say things like just, merely, only, etc. when you talk about yourself, like, oh, it was just because of this, or, you know, I only did this, it's not that big of a deal, that kind of thing. Try to catch yourself. Um, you could also use a journal for that, note when you do it, 
and try to catch yourself and replace it with other language. Just take out that just, just that merely take out all those things. So instead of saying when you, when you're about to say, well, it was just because I studied really hard in this case, instead of saying that, just say, yeah, I uh, studied really hard in this case, right? It feels weird to do that, but it's just one little simple kind of language hack that can help out a bit. And, uh, that's that's mostly what I would have to suggest about that. Try to notice when you're using those words. Try to notice when you're attributing things to luck instead of your internal characteristics. And uh, try to enlist people that can help you out, either as those little mental avatars or actually talk to people about it. Let them, you know, sometimes you get into this little bubble where you're not really getting the perspective from other people that are not as mean to you as you are. And breaking that bubble and having people kind of smack you around a little bit and say, you're being dumb, uh, you're obviously great, sometimes that can help. Even if you don't believe them all the way, you know, it's you're, if you're going to be logical, how are all these people saying this to you, going out of their way to say this to you when it's not true, right? So be scientific, be realistic, you know, take some data, try to adjust your filter by writing down three things that you're proud of every day, and that might be a good start for you. Okay, next one comes from an anonymous uh, asker, question asker, listener, person. <laughs> oh man, guys, I'm tired. Um, so they ask, I have a lot of trouble when it comes to relationships. I have tendencies that make it difficult to feel a healthy closeness. I tend to have codependent tendencies. I attach myself to people that I believe need my help. I'm selfless towards others to a point where I start to feel like I'm neglecting myself. At this point, I sometimes start to resent the other person because they're not reciprocating my selflessness. I also start to greatly resent myself for letting this happen. I'm frustrated because I feel as though I keep doing this and I'm so tired of feeling so vulnerable. How can I break this cycle? Is there hope to, um, I think they, mo they meant to write salvage. Is there hope to salvage a relationship of this type or manage a relationship of this type? Um, or is it always best to leave? So this is a really good question. Um, this is somebody who has very, very strong feelings in a relationship. And I really appreciate you, for one, just being so open and vulnerable about it. If you're saying that you're tired of feeling so vulnerable, um, I appreciate you being willing to ask about it here. Now, I want to preface what I'm about to say by saying that I'm not diagnosing you because that would be impossible for me to do. And I also don't necessarily think that you completely fall into this camp. Um, but some of the behaviors that you're describing are similar to what is seen in what's called borderline personality disorder. And borderline personality disorder is basically a very boom and bust sort of way of relating to other people. So when you first attach to somebody, you come on very strong. You know, you're um, very idolizing, you're very caring, you're very giving, you're just really intensely in it. But once you have a sort of perceived slight, or you think that they maybe they are uh, lingering, or sorry, not lingering, but like uh, going off towards somebody else, there's some sort of interruption to that, it swings the other direction, right? So it's kind of back and forth. Um, so some of the behaviors you're describing are somewhat similar to that. And so I'm going to approach it kind of from that perspective. Like I said, I'm not saying that you you have borderline, but what I'm saying is that this sort of falls under a similar umbrella because it sounds like this is uh, these are strong impulses that are hard for you to, to, to really cope with. So, you know, what can you do about it? Um, one thing that you could do about it is to use friends. And um, these have to be people that are not also in a similar pattern of, be of behaviors in relationships. So in my book... Um, in my book, Fuck Depression, I talk about these as logical barometers. So what that means is uh, barometer is basically like a a meter, right? It's, a, it's, it's an air pressure meter, but um, in this case, I'm talking about, you know, for your logic. So somebody that is a good meter of whether you're being logical or not. So pick a friend who you see as successful, as good at having relationships, that sort of thing, and have several of them. And use them sort of as a panel of, am I going too far in this? Is the way I'm acting normal? Is it above and beyond? Uh, kind of take their advice about it. And I don't necessarily mean that you need to take their advice and, and take that as fact. But 
there's some additional perspective because what seems like happens to you is you get really wrapped up in this world of this relationship. And sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees. You don't necessarily, you're not able to look at yourself and see the way that you're acting until after the fact. And then when it's done, like you said, then you start getting frustrated and resenting yourself for letting it happen again. But when you're in it, it's really hard to get that perspective, that sort of external perspective. So having friends who serve as those logical barometers, that can really help out because they can give you that outside perspective um, during the relationship or during that sort of uh, time period for you. So that's one thing that could help. And the thing is, you know, you're, you're not going to necessarily agree with them, but you're going to be closer to agreeing with them than if they didn't say anything at all, if that makes sense, right? You're going to be uh, you're going to benefit from their perspective, even if you don't take it to heart 100%. Another thing that you can do is, um, I'm going to go back to journaling here, but you can keep a journal and you can use that to track the critical points in your relationships. So what are those points where you know things are kind of going south or you know when you've gone a bit too far? So is it when you, um, I can't even I can't begin to think of an example, but like when you realize that you've called three times uh, when they didn't pick up the first time, when you um, are mad at them for something that they never said they were going to do in the first place, uh, things like that. So whatever those critical periods for you are when looking back on past relationships, that's when you can consider your behavior to be a little bit beyond what's, what's normal. So keeping a journal can help with that because maybe you don't know what those things are offhand. You don't know what those things are off the top of your head. But looking back at a journal that you've kept this information in over time, you can maybe identify some of those patterns. You know, it's important to remember that keeping a list of checks and balances is not how a relationship works. Not all relationships are completely symmetrical. There are things that you provide to your partner that your partner doesn't provide for you and vice versa. And in a large sort of cosmic sense, sure, it balances out, but it's not literally, you know, I did this, so you need to do this back, or why didn't you think of this when I thought of this? That's a really uh, difficult way, and it's a very difficult standard to uphold within a relationship. Um, one thing that can also help is, is therapy. Um, there's a, a couple uh, approaches to therapy that are particularly helpful for this. So one of them is called DBT, which is Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. This was a therapy that was created to manage borderline uh, tendencies. And again, like I said, don't put too much stock into that word. But in this case, it could be very helpful because what it does is it teaches you to cope with those really strong emotions. And instead of reacting to those and kind of throwing out what you had built up, instead it teaches you to kind of roll with them, to use them in a more effective way, and to center yourself a bit more, to be more grounded and mindful and uh, it's very helpful for issues like this. Um, another one would be CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is one that I talk about a lot, which is basically forcing you to be a little more objective, a little more scientific, keep track of your patterns and, and challenge your thinking patterns. Um, I would say, though, if you could, DBT would be the first choice here. You know, the way that, that you tend to think in relationships, and this is not a knock against you, I'm just kind of echoing what you've said, is very black and white, right? It's kind of all or nothing. And once that uh, switch is flipped, it's kind of hard to come back from that. I would say to your question of whether it's um, worth it to always leave, I would say sometimes it's not always best to leave. Because when you do leave, one thing that you're doing is you're reinforcing your escape instinct right? Um, so what you get from escaping is relief because you're in that critical period where you're either going to have to work through this in a relationship and it's going to be really hard and uncomfortable and icky and scary, or you can drop it and oh, take a big old deep breath and feel relieved, right? So that relief of just dropping it is very immediately reinforcing. It's immediately reinforcing. You get, you get rid of those immediate icky feelings Later on, you come in and kind of kick your own ass about it and beat yourself up in your head, but immediately it's reinforcing. So I would encourage you to not always just drop it, to try to struggle through it a bit. And you could do that by being honest with the other person. You know, you'd be so surprised about how bringing these things out into the open takes away some of their power. You know, you say that I have trouble with this. This is how some of my relationships have gone in the past. And I really want to try to make it a point to not do that 
you know, continuing forward. And then, you know, this, this other person that you're with, your partner, they can be aware of that. So they can take your actions with that context in mind. They don't hold things against you the same way they might if you hadn't mentioned it. And maybe there's times when they just need to kind of call you on your BS too, and vice versa. You do the same thing for them. Um, a good rule of thumb too is maybe try to make it a point if you already know from the beginning, try to make it a point to not date people that you feel like are, they need your help, like they're hopeless cases that, you know, you're being selfless by dating them. Try to date people that um, are more on an even playing field where you don't feel that. And maybe you don't feel the same kind of really strong, heavy attraction to them that you would feel somebody who's maybe wounded or needs your help. But that's a good thing in this case, right? We don't need all of that intense, strong emotion. You need to figure out how to live in this uh, more mild zone. So these, these suggestions, therapy, soul searching, you know, um, journaling, all these ways can help you to kind of identify what this is fulfilling for you, how it's being maintained, how you're, you know, kind of reinforcing your own escape instinct. And it can help you to kind of just directly push back against that. So hopefully that wasn't too rambling and incoherent, but I think that there's a few nuggets in there, right? So using your journal, using friends as those logical barometers, um, maybe looking into therapy like DBT and uh, not escaping relationships whenever you can, being open about your struggle and making it a point to try to start off on the right foot and not just date people who you feel are wounded or need your help. Okay, so we got one more anonymous question here. And uh, this one is related to stomach issues. So they write, all my life, I've gotten really bad stomach aches from anxiety. I don't suffer from severe anxiety, but obvious things like public speaking or receiving bad news trigger it. When I was a kid, I figured that this is what butterflies in the stomach was. As I grew older, I began to thinking that this couldn't be just butterflies. It hurts too much. My stomach aches are crippling to where I can't move for a minute or so. Sometimes it does feel like I have to use the bathroom. I've never bothered to ask my doctor about it. Actually, it's never seemed severe enough, so I never remember to bring it up. I doubt medicine could fix it anyway. I don't remember anyone bringing the subject up or discussing it, so I thought I might. So my questions to you are, what are your thoughts on this? Is this problem common? Are there any ways to deal with this, or am I just forever cursed with this symptom? So I wanted to take this question because um, I think it's probably something that a lot of people listening, especially if if my instinct is correct, and there's quite a few uh, anxiety cases out there amongst you guys, um, a lot of you guys probably experienced this or something similar, because a sour stomach, upset stomach, diarrhea, things like that, definitely an associated symptom with anxiety. Um, but it's something that obviously is a little bit harder to talk about in polite company. It's a little bit, you know, this is not something that you talk about always when you're talking about anxiety. So yeah, you know, it's something that it, it sucks, right? You know, uh, some people it's, it's really bad. Some, sometimes people are at work and they have to go to do a presentation or they have a meeting with their boss, but they kind of need to leave early because they need to go to the bathroom or they, they don't make it there quite in time because of that reason. And it, it's tough to deal with. So there's a part of this that's always, you know, going to be there if that's your tendency and, um, you know, if, you, if your physiological form of anxiety is, is just very tuned into your stomach, but there's also things that can be done, right? So I definitely think that you should bring it up with your doctor. It would be a mistake to assume that there's nothing that can be done about it and that it's purely due to anxiety. Stomach issues, such as like chronic inflation, uh, Crohn's disease, uh, other issues like that, that are kind of low and slow and they, they, they are annoying on a daily basis and then they occasionally have these flare-ups, those can be um, interacting with anxiety. So anxiety can cause those flare ups, right? And that doesn't mean that you don't have stomach issues in its own right. So it's definitely something to check out because your doctor can do some tests. They can help you understand if there are any big issues going on that you just weren't aware of, or, you know, it's hard because you have no metric. You can't put yourself in somebody else's body and see what their form of stomach pain feels like. Maybe you feel like I'm just being a baby. Maybe you feel like, you know, it's not that bad, but to somebody else, they'd be totally crippled. Um, so it's hard to have that perspective. So talking to your doctor about it and having them run some tests could be very, very helpful. And then if there is an issue, hopefully there's no issue, you know, no serious issue going on for you, but say there is, 
and there's medication that can help out, then boom, you kind of took care of, of a big chunk of that problem. Um, there are also medications that can help out in general with upset stomach, um, chronic up to upset stomach. Again, that's something to talk to your medical doctor about. I'm not going to give you advice about that in particular, but you're feeling that medicine couldn't fix it anyway. Uh, that could be totally wrong. So definitely look into it. Definitely ask your doctor about it. Um, but it can also be the result just of extended stress reaction, right? It's a normal reaction to feel uh, queasy, to feel upset stomach, all of that kind of thing when you are under stress. So like you said, when there's an exam, public speaking, that kind of thing, bad news, etc. That's normal. That's a normal part of the stress reaction. But if you're in, extended, in an extended stress reaction where you never really get the chance to bounce back from that, it can have sort of an additive effect where, you know, you just, you're taking another hit and another hit and it just hurts more and more each time. And so, you know, focusing on reducing your anxiety can help with that. A lot of people, you know, they say, I'm not a very anxious person. And when they say that, they mean that they don't have a lot of worries in their mind and it doesn't keep them awake at night and things like that. Sometimes physiological symptoms are the primary thing that's driving, you know, your anxiety. That's how it manifests. So there is a little bit of anxiety going on and it's, it's continuing and people maybe don't focus on that because they figure, you know, it's just the physical symptoms. It's not actually anxiety, but maybe it is for you. So maybe using all the coping skills that I've talked about in this podcast, that I've talked about in my book and then elsewhere to reduce your overall level of anxiety, to cope better with it maybe that will have a positive effect on the way that your stomach is, is acting. You know, another thing to talk about with your doctor or a dietitian is your diet. Um, sometimes there are sensitivities going on. Sometimes you're just, uh, think you're eating well, but you're really not. Whatever the case may be, that is another one of those rule outs that could make a very simple solution. So all of this is worth looking into. My, my main thing that I want to say is that yes, this is common. Um, but no, it's not always something that you just have to deal with forever. So look into it a bit more. If it turns out that there's nothing going on, that's great. Um, maybe they can give you a little bit of, of medication just to have on hand if it gets really bad. Um, and also focus on just your own self-care. Look at your diet. Look at the way that you're exercising. Look at how you're managing your anxiety. And that might help to reduce it a little bit. All right, so a good question there. Like I said, I wanted to take it because it's not talked about a whole lot. All right, we made it. So that was all the questions. My voice didn't give out completely, even though this is a little bit more of a quiet, rumbly episode, I think. Um, thank you so much for tuning in again. I really appreciate your questions. Please keep sending them in. They're really great. I, I, I'm so just blown away by how honest you guys are, how open you guys are. It's great. This is The whole reason I started this was because I get so many questions through email and Twitter and things like that already, and it's really just not a good idea for me to engage with each one of you individually and give you advice over the internet. You know, you're not my therapy patients, but this is a way that I can take it and address it to a much larger audience. So I can take the questions that you have and answer it for everybody that has a similar question to that. So please keep the questions coming. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm at Duff the Psych on Twitter, Duff the Psych at gmail.com is the email that you can reach me at. So please send us questions and then tune in next week for that awesome new interview. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Bye.